Good day. As is traditional with most of these videos which I do about the world crisis which focuses on Ukraine, I'm going to start with a brief rundown of military events in Ukraine over the last couple of hours. Now, one of the most interesting things in discussing military events in Ukraine is that there is this now increasing disjunction between the sort of military events that I see reported on Russian and, by the way, also Ukrainian sites and telegram channels where the actual fighting is conducted and the reporting that I'm getting in the Western media, especially in the British media. Now, the most important single event that took place in terms of the eventual outcome of the war um, in Ukraine on the military side, at least over the last week, and by general consensus amongst Russian and Ukrainian commentators, was the capture of Popoznaya, this important town of Popoznaya in northern Donbass, by the Russian and the Allied armies. As I've discussed in previous videos, this puts the Ukrainian forces in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk in an extremely precarious position. They're now facing outright encirclement and quite possibly eventual collapse. By the way, there's now increasing numbers of doubts about the true numbers of troops in uh, Ukrainian troops who would be trapped in these two towns, Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. But I'm going to stick with the number of 8,000, which I've seen in both Russian and Ukrainian sources, and which seems to me to be the most plausible. Other figures which put the number much higher seem to me unlikely. Anyway, that seems to me the biggest single event. The second important event, which I'm going to come to in more detail, is the Battle of Snake Island that took place over the course of the previous few days and about which the Russian Defence Ministry has had much to say. Well, I've been reading the British media. Um, I haven't, I will admit, read the US media to the same degree. But I've been reading the British media, the various British newspapers that cover the fighting in Ukraine. I've been looking at the at Reuters, the British news agency. And I have to some extent also obviously followed what the US media is saying. And the most astonishing thing for me is that I haven't been able to find any reference in any of them to the fall of Popoznaya or even to the Battle of Snake Island. Instead, there is, to the extent that there's any coverage now of actual military developments in the war, there is the continued debates and reporting about the events in Azovstal, where there's also a, a great deal about the missile strikes in Odessa, though these are divorced from their actual context, which is quite, quite obviously the uh, battle over Snake Island. And, of course, there's also a great deal said about the Kharkov counteroffensive that the Ukrainian military seem to be conducting. And one of the odd things about this is that British media commentary about this Kharkov counteroffensive seems to be a great deal more optimistic and, um, if I have to say, triumphalist than the Ukrainians themselves are. It's a case that the Ukrainians have advanced, that they've retaken certain villages. Uh, the Russians claim that uh, these villages were vacated as the Russian troops in this part of the world uh, um, carried out a re, um, realignment or a repositioning to more secure defence lines. It's clear that the forces involved on both sides in this area are not especially large. The Ukrainian force is said to um, amount to a brigade force. Now, a brigade in the United States military can be up to 5,000 men, but I suspect that Ukrainian brigades are significantly smaller. And I don't know how many troops the Russians and their allied forces have in this area, but I doubt that they're much more. Anyway, there's been 
A lot of talk about this Kharkiv counter-offensive, which to my mind is a sideshow to the overall war. There's been, as I said, some reporting about the missile strikes in Odessa. There's been some reports about the shelling of Azovstal. But about the fall of Popaznaya and the Battle of Snake Island, there's been nothing at all. Now, on the subject of the fall of Popaznaya, we get more information, apparently an important settlement, or at least a strategically important settlement, or so everybody seems to agree. Though, again, I stress I'm not the best person to understand these matters. Called Yampol has apparently now been captured by the Russians. Uh, uh, Krasny Liman, as the Russians call it, Liman, as the Ukrainians call it, this settlement on the way to Slavyansk is now apparently under immense pressure. The Ukrainian forces there are under immense pressure and there's talk that they might actually be withdrawn. And more importantly, perhaps, the fact that Yampol has been captured, at least according to my perhaps defective reading of the maps, suggests that the Russians and their allied forces are planning a simultaneous advance on Kramatorsk um, alongside their other offensive towards Slavyansk, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk being the places in northern Donetsk region where Ukrainian forces appear to be increasingly concentrating as their front lines start to crumble. Anyway, you won't find anything about this in, as I said, the British media or and perhaps that extends to the US media as well. I have to say that that does all surprise me. Maybe the people who run these journals, the various British newspapers, and television stations and all the rest, um, feel that the fall of Popaznaya, the debacle, the Ukrainian debacle of Snake Island, maybe they feel that these are not particularly important events. Though, as I said, both Russians and Ukrainians seem to think otherwise. But I can't help but think that the real reason that the Western media isn't covering these stories on the battlefront is because these are, of course, Ukrainian defeats. And, of course, as a result, they don't correspond with the current orthodoxy, which is of Ukraine successfully resisting and even going on the offensive in a few places. Now, turning back to the topic of the battle for Snake Island, I speculated in my last video that this was a consequence of amateur decision-making by the political leadership in Kiev, that the political leadership in Kiev is giving um, militarily illogical or irrational orders, both to stand and fight in the Donbass, where troops are coming under, Ukrainian troops are coming under relentless pressure, um, and heavy artillery are taking massive casualties in consequence, and also in terms of Snake Island, that this was essentially an attempt by the political leadership of Ukraine to join a propaganda to achieve a propaganda win in order to rain on Russia's parade its victory day parade on the 9th of May now that was speculation but another party has now joined that speculation or at least they deny it speculation they report it as fact and that is the Russian defense ministry they've issued a bulletin in which they say that the Ukrainian uh, military, the Ukrainian general staff, strongly advised against the attempt to recapture Snake Island. They said it was dangerously and desperately risky. But they say, the Russian defense ministry say, that their words of wisdom, the Ukrainian general staff's words of wisdom about the attempt to recapture Snake Island were disregarded by President Zelensky and his political advisers, who instead took advice from Western, specifically British advisers, and that this is what resulted in the attack 
on Snake Island, which ended in a total debacle. And the Russians have provided more details about the extent of that debacle. They say that 14 Ukrainian aircraft have been destroyed, that three amphibious boats have also been destroyed, that Ukrainians lost a, a large amount of equipment, that um, um, several dozen Ukrainian soldiers were killed, and that bodies, Ukrainian bodies, are still being washed ashore by the sea and are being collected by, presumably, the Russian garrison, which has presumably been returned to Snake Island. Now, it's clear to me that this was, from a Ukrainian point of view, a total debacle. And there's also reports, which I've seen from Ukrainian sources, that um, um, something like um, um, large numbers of Bayraktar drones were lost in two weeks in the battle over, in, in, over trying to capture Snake Island, and that Turkey is becoming increasingly concerned about this, and that almost as many Bayraktar drones were lost in these uh, naval confrontations over Snake Island as have been lost in all of the rest of the war. I can't confirm any of this. And if I can also say about the Russian claims that the attack on Snake Island was a political decision made by uh, Zelensky and his team, disregarding the advice of the Ukrainian general staff, well, and that, the, and that Zelensky and his team acted on British advice, well, I have to say that I obviously can't corroborate that either. One should be extremely careful to, uh, before assuming that something that one side in a conflict says about the other is true. And I do wonder, besides, where the Russians got this information from. I'm going to disregard the claims about the British. It would not surprise me if they were true. But um, it's quite clear to me that the Russians, perhaps unsurprisingly, have developed a feeling about the British, which is that the British are the most um, belligerent of all the Western powers in this conflict. And whenever anything happens like this, the Russians always seem to reach for the British to blame first. That may be right in this case. As I said, it wouldn't surprise me. But frankly, given the emotions, I'm not going to assume that it's true. Uh, but on the probability that this was a political decision, this attempt to capture Snake Island was a political decision, and that Zelensky made it in order to try to, as I said, reign on Russia's Victory Day parade, which is what the Russian Defence Ministry says. Well, I have to say that, again, um, I think that is almost certainly true. It's interesting that the Russian Defence Ministry appears to believe the same, but I'm going to say also that my completely uncorroborated guess cannot be corroborated by this Russian statement, given that I don't know what sort of information it's based upon. It could be that the Russians are guessing as well. Anyway, that seems to me a fair summary of the situation on the ground. What we are also seeing, however, in Ukraine and away from the battlefront are increasing signs of unrest on the part of the families of many of the soldiers who are fighting for Ukraine. And we're getting more and more reports now of protests from these families. Um, there's been a rather distressing um, message sent by a group of families of one particular um, Ukrainian uh, unit which has been fighting in the Severodonetsk, Lysychansk um, area. Um, the, the families of the soldiers have asked for the unit to be recalled, to be rotated. They say that it has been in constant battle ever since the war started in February, that the men are running out of ammunition and supplies, 
and um, in addition they are now completely exhausted and there are other reports of other Ukrainians coming back saying that the condition of the Ukrainian troops in Donbass is becoming hellish and that they are under unbelievable and unbearable pressure as they are coming under relentless attacks from the Russians and their allied forces and are subjected to overwhelming artillery fire. I think all this is true and I have to say that the longer the war continues um, I suspect the more of these protests will happen and it is not impossible that they could eventually grow to the point where they become a serious problem for the Zelensky government, um, especially if there is a collapse in Donbass, which I will come to in a moment, then I think that a lot of the people who are now protesting will start to feel that their menfolk have been betrayed and sent into battle. I've even seen, by the way, a Ukrainian site, or at least what claims to be a Ukrainian site, which is now stalk, starting to talk about many Ukrainian troops being treated as cannon fodder. <laughs> I can't, I'm not absolutely sure how um, much credence to place upon this site and whether it is indeed even Ukrainian, but anyway. But anyway, I, I suspect that there will be more protests, more complaints, and there may eventually come a point, there usually does in these sort of wars, where um, the families of people who are conscripted into the battle to be sent to Donbass start, start opposing conscription and where you start to see the men refusing to serve, refusing to be sent to what must seem to them to be, if not certain death, at least likely death or capture or severe wounding. I'm going to say also that some of these protests appear to be taking place in western and central Ukraine. And I do wonder whether many of the families um, of the soldiers from these regions are wondering, are asking themselves the same question that I am asking, which is why are young men, or in fact not so young men, men in their 40s and older, being sent to fight, and in many cases to die, in Donbass, which is a completely different region of Ukraine, where people are Russian-speaking and appear to identify with Russia. Why was the Ukrainian army not pulled back from Donbass to more defendable lines and to defending regions of Ukraine where there might be support from the population and where the population might feel that their presence is actually wanted. Anyway, that all remains for the future. But we've also had an assessment of the situation, the overall, the uh, general situation of the war in Ukraine from a another source and this one I found extremely interesting because the person in question was Avril Haines, who is the Biden administration's director of national intelligence. She holds the position which under Barack Obama was uh, held by um, James Clapper. Uh, um, she coordinates all the intelligence agencies and provides intelligence summaries or arranges for the intelligence summaries to be provided to the president and she gave um, she gave testimony recently about the state of the war to congress and i couldn't help but think reading the media accounts of what she said especially the one in the financial times that she gave a much more uh, sober assessment of the state of the war than you will get from most of the Western media. First of all, she said that President Putin of Russia has not in any way um, retreated from any one of his objectives in Ukraine. And he still, he still appears to believe <coughs> that he can achieve them. Secondly, she said that the 
objective of the Russians at the present time is to encircle the best Ukrainian army, part of the Ukrainian army, which is the army in Donbass, and to crush it. And importantly, she said that the Russians might well, would probably achieve that objective, though she seemed to think that it would probably take them months to do so rather than weeks. She may be wrong about that, but anyway, the fact is she does seem to think that there is a high prospect, probability even, that the Ukrainian forces in Donbass will indeed be encircled and crushed. And she then spoke about the possibilities of Russia moving beyond the Donbass in order to fulfill <coughs> President Putin's larger objectives, about which, by the way, she didn't seem to me to be particularly clear what she thought they were, but she seemed to believe that uh, the Russians would have to mobilize more extensive, bigger forces in, a, in order to capture places like um, Odessa and presumably Kharkov and the rest. That may be true, but of course I would say that if the better part of the Ukrainian army has been destroyed in Donbass, then that would presumably, beyond a certain point, change the, change the military balance in Ukraine itself, even if the Russians only have the existing forces in Ukraine that they have, and it may be that they don't need to deploy more forces. Anyway, that's me. Again, don't assume that these assessments are necessarily true. So, Haynes, it seems to me, pointed to a more sober, a more realistic assessment <clears throat> of, the, uh, of the state of the conflict than we get from much of the media. And I'm assuming <clears throat> that she's giving the same advice to the President of the United States. <clears throat> and that's interesting, because of course, the fact that Ukraine seems likely to lose Donbass, even Haynes seems to think so. <clears throat> the fact that <clears throat> the better part of the Ukrainian army in Donbass looks like it's going to be de destroyed, that doesn't seem to be <clears throat> affecting the Biden administration's political decision making. <clears throat> we see the Biden administration instead signing up to this uh, Lend-Lease um, agreement with Ukraine, still committed to the $40 billion aid package. I would point out that both the Lend-Lease package and the $40 billion aid package are not exclusively for Ukraine. They seem to be also intended to re-equip East European NATO armies, Poland's, Romania's and the rest, with Western, with American equipment. But anyway, the Biden administration seems to be continuing, persisting with all of these decisions. And one has to ask, is this wise? Does this make any very great sense, given the fact, as I said, that it looks as if even the administration's own director of national intelligence suggests that Ukraine is about to lose what is by far the biggest and most important battle of the war, the battle in Donbass. One would have thought that throwing money into Ukraine in that kind of situation is simply, going, is simply a case of throwing money and equipment away. Well, Biden did say that he was worried about how he would find Putin an off-ramp out of this war. And I do wonder whether perhaps it's not Putin that he's thinking about, but rather himself and the administration, that having concluded, perhaps after the fall of Popoznaya, that the battle 
of Donbass is almost certainly lost, he might be looking for some sort of way out for himself and for the United States. And it's interesting that Mario Draghi, the Italian Prime Minister, who's now also come to uh, Washington, appears to have come with the same message. Now, Draghi what turned from being someone who advised against uh, uh, um, dis disconnecting Russian banks from SWIFT, oil and gas sanctions, and all of those things in the run-up to the war, Draghi, very much like Olaf Scholz of Germany, went from being a realist to an extreme hardliner. And he is up to now signed up and supported all the toughest sanctions pa packages. But he's now, I think, begun to have serious doubts. Because with reports from various people, including Avril Haynes, that this war could actually drag on for a very long time, with indications that Ukraine is losing, Draghi must be starting to wonder whether the economic costs, which countries like Italy are going to be bearing very hard, are really appropriate, and whether in fact this is really a war that Europe can afford. And there are reports that Draghi has now said to Biden that this is an extremely difficult situation, that this war could very well change the situation in Europe, um, with the implication change the situation not for the better, and that some sort of diplomatic solution must therefore be found. Now, that's Draghi. He's the leader of a big European state, Italy. I wonder whether before long other voices are going to start joining in. We're seeing increasing numbers of German business leaders say the same, but this is, to my mind, the first important leader of a big European state who's coming out and who's talking in this way. Well, we'll see whether or not um, Draghi's advice uh, um, has any, carries any weight. In the meantime, Ukraine itself has taken an extraordinary step, which, as far as I can see, can only reinforce the concerns that many people in Europe must already be feeling about where all this is going, which is that uh, Ukraine switched off one of the major uh, routes whereby gas um, is sent to Europe from Russia across Ukraine. Up to now, both the Russians and the Ukrainians have left gas uh, transit across Ukraine uh, continue unimpeded. Yesterday, the Ukrainians took the extraordinary step of switching off one of the um, transmission lines. And this has apparently reduced the amount of gas, Russian gas, flowing to Germany by 25%. Now, this is potentially a problem for Germany because What's become absolutely clear to me is that Robert Habeck, the German economics minister, who's been going around telling everybody that Germany will have reduced its um, gas dependence on Russia by uh, 75% by the end of the year, is, as we say in Britain, talking out of his hat. In other words, he's talking nonsense. What he's actually been trying to do is buy as much gas as possible from the Russians over the course of the spring and summer, fill up Germany's natural gas uh, reservoirs, uh, formerly Russian-owned and controlled, controlled by Gazprom, but now confiscated by the Germans in a way that, frankly, I consider illegal. But anyway, that's what Habeck did, fill up these uh, uh, natural gas uh, reservoirs uh, and then reduce purchases of natural gas from Russia over the course of the winter and hope that this is somehow uh, um, enough to persuade people that Germany's reduced or cut back its dependence on Russian natural gas and then 
well, perhaps hope that by this point the sanctions will have had their effect on Russia, or conceivably that the Russians will have been defeated militarily, or perhaps, well, who knows what. Anyway, that seems to me to have been Habeck's policy. The trouble is, it does depend even on its own terms, and I'm going to say that the policy seems to be incredibly flawed anyway, because it has uh, so many hostages to fortune. I mean, what if Russia is still uh, going strong and winning the war in Ukraine throughout the winter? What does Germany then do um, if, when, inevitably, the natural gas reserves become depleted? Anyway, that's another story. But regardless of that, this plan, to the extent that it's even a plan, does depend on filling up those reservoirs. Now, Germany is already having to reduce the amount of gas it puts in because it's now having to transfer gas to Poland and Finland and the Baltic states and Bulgaria because those, con those uh, countries are refusing to cooperate with Vladimir Putin's gas for rubles scheme. By the way, a big German gas company has confirmed that it is in fact now paying, uh, that it is now complying with Putin's directive. So it's now openly confirmed that at least one big German company is complying with Putin's gas for rubles scheme. But anyway, what this means is that since the Russians are not increasing volumes to compensate for the lower demand, the supposedly lower demand, from uh, uh, um, Finland and all of these other places. They're not, rather, they're not allowing volumes to fall. Uh, 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 they're, not, they're not keeping up volumes so that there isn't more gas available. What that means is that Habeck is having to divert gas to Finland and Poland and Bulgaria, and he's not able to make that gas up from Russia. And if this Ukrainian cutoff continues for much longer, well, then he's going to have problems keeping up the amount of gas he gets from Russia. And he may find it very difficult to fill up the reserves to the necessary level by the autumn. I suspect that Habeck is probably on the phone to Kiev anxiously trying to get the Ukrainians to reopen their gas transmission pipes. Now, that begs the question of why did the Ukrainians take this step? Well, it may not be a complete coincidence that this has happened whilst the German foreign minister, um, Habeck's green colleague, Annalena Baerbock, is in Kiev. And Baerbock has made all kinds of promises to the Ukrainians. She said that she thinks that Ukraine should be immediately admitted to the European Union. This comes after France and Italy have both expressed opposition to that step. And, of course, she's also again talked about the need for Ukraine to be supplied by heavy we with heavy weapons, even though Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, the head of the government of which Baerbock and Harbeck are both members, has also expressed his deep scepticism and opposition about that policy too. So we seem to me to be in a situation where the Ukrainians are putting pressure on the Germans to get the Germans to make even ever more radical commitments. It is the Ukrainians, in effect, in other words, who are using coercive diplomacy with gas against the Germans, not the Russians, even though the Germans have allied themselves with the Ukrainians and against the Russians. At least that's the only interpretation that I can see of these events which makes any kind of sense. The Ukrainians, and I will say this is their explanation, they're saying that in fact it's something to do with Russian actions in Lugansk region, which has prevented the opening of this pipeline. But I don't think anybody takes this 
particularly seriously. So it's interesting to see that though we hear so much about Russia's supposed weaponization of its gas supply, the country that is weaponizing at least its position as a transit state is Ukraine, something which of course it has done twice before in 2006 and 2009. And as happened in 2006, 2009, the Germans, instead of complaining about it, are going along with it. Now, it is a case, obviously, of biting the hand that feeds you. But, as I said, since Ukraine's been able to get away with it before, I suppose that they probably think, rightly, that they will get away with it again. But I can't help but think that this particular episode must once more be feeding doubts amongst some people in Europe, people like Draghi and the business leaders in Germany and the unions that back the SPD about where all of this is going. Whilst I'm on the topic of the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, Germany's oldest party, political party, the party of Olaf Scholz, the uh, supposed chancellor, um, the SPD did extremely badly in a recent um, um, regional election and is also expected to do badly in a follow-up one. Now, some are attributing this to impatience, with Olaf Scholz's failure to take a stronger line against Russia. I can't help but wonder whether it's a case of what's left of the SPD's working class base becoming increasingly exasperated by the way in which the SPD is allowing working class living standards in Germany to come under continuous pressure on behalf of Ukraine. In Washington, in the United States, I'm increasingly seeing some Republican uh, uh, members of Congress, people who it must be said are more aligned with the Trump wing of the party than the Mitch McConnell wing, coming along and saying that President Biden seems to be increasingly the president for Ukraine, rather than the President of the United States. I wonder how long it will be before Germans start to ask themselves the question where the leaders like Baerbock and Habeck and even Scholz aren't really ultimately more committed to Ukraine than they are to Germany itself. Anyway, this is, as everyone will appreciate, a very complex evolving picture. My own sense is that the Russian military advances in Donbass are now unstoppable. I doubt that the United States is going to be able to replace the hardware that Ukraine is losing. And of course, the other thing that Ukraine is losing is its best troops, for those in Donbass. The U U United States and the West can always, of course, you train more Ukrainian troops, but one has to wonder whether we can keep up whether they can keep up with the level of Ukraine's losses. This has been the problem right through the war. Ukraine is losing men and material faster than the West can replace it. That has been the calculus throughout and nothing that has happened is changing it. Western supplies can delay the inevitable, but they can't change the outcome. The Russians have repeatedly made this point. The fact is that the West has disregarded it. It's assumed that attrition, both economic and military attrition, will work against the Russians. We're seeing in the battlefields of Donbass that this is not the case. And perhaps with Mario Draghi's trip to Washington, we're beginning to see the first signs that European leaders are beginning to realize that in economic terms, the war of attrition isn't going the West's way either. Well, that's enough for me today. More from me soon. In the meantime, please remember that you can find all of our videos on Locals and Rumble 
and of course if you watch our videos on rumble then if you go to the top of the red maroon button you go to the top of the video you will see the red maroon button you can press that button that will take you directly to our locals homepage. if you go to our locals homepage, you can decide to become an active member and that will entitle you to participate in my Wednesday live streams, which take place every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time. And of course, we're present on lots of other platforms as well, including the new free speech platform, SuperU, and also Odyssey. And last but not least, please remember that you can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. You can also go to our shop, and by the great things that you will find there are famous magic mugs and other great merchandise. And last but not least, also please remember, if you want to show your appreciation, if you like this video, you can tick the like button to this video and press check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon. And with every day, I'm glad to say, my cold, my cough, is getting better so hopefully no more problems with my voice before very long.